find mute you guys just in case there's any background noise which might uh, interrupt things. Right, let's kick off. So thank you for joining. I think uh, what's very interesting is that we have a number of people who have expressed an interest into buying properties on the Costa del Sol. Hello, Javier, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a number of people interested in buying properties on the Costa del Sol, but they want to understand the ins and outs of things. So uh, we've got partners on the call. Tancred, for instance, is our mortgage broker partner. Uh, we have customers on the call, and uh, I'm sure more will join later, just perhaps the 12 p.m. start has been difficult to come straight on. I'm recording this as well so that I can share it with people who haven't managed to make it. But essentially, the agenda is quite simple. Uh, we're going to go through a few things, and uh, the most important thing, I think, is to really give you a guide to the different areas in the Costa del Sol, because I think a lot of people understand that the Costa del Sol is quite a large geographic space, but haven't really got a, any full understanding of where would be best for them. So the first point on the agenda will be to go through the areas. Okay, so in the meantime, I may, I may share my screen so that you guys can actually see what I'm working through. Okay, so here's my screen. One second. Can you all see the guide to areas at the top? Nod would be great, perfect. So essentially, um, you guys uh, may or may not know that the main international airport uh, for the Costa del Sol is Malaga International Airport here, uh, which I'm highlighting. Can you see my cursor? Okay, good. So when you get into Malaga Airport, and by the way, Malaga Airport is very well connected to all the major European hubs, so we're talking about regular multiple flights per day from the London airports, multiple flights per day from Paris and from places like Copenhagen. So really it's very accessible. As you land into Malaga, you're expected, I, I think about, it's quite an efficient airport, but probably another 40 to minutes to one hour in order to get through uh, immigration, collect your bags. So we always talk about end-to-end -end travel time. And anywhere from Northern Europe, you're looking at an end-to-end -end travel time of about maybe four to five hours. You know, you've got the travel time at your home country. Flying into Malaga can be two to three hours from most European centers. And then at the other end, if you were to buy a property all the way down in Estepona, that's about one hour's travel time from Malaga Airport. So in all, uh, the Costa del Sol is very well connected and very accessible. So obviously, there are people that expect uh, shorter travel times. And what that means is there's a lot of properties which are perhaps more expensive due to the fact that the, there's closer proximity to Malaga Airport. So if you look at areas like Ben or Madina, now Ben or Madina has got a bad reputation from perhaps all the British lager louts who have come there from years gone by. But what has happened now in Ben or Madina is there's been a lot of really interesting development. So really cutting edge design, modern apartments in Ben or Madina. Most of them in a place called Ben or Madina Pueblo, which is up uh, from the sea. So you have Ben or Madina Costa and you have Ben or Madina Pueblo. Now you can find two bedroom apartments which are brand new here, starting around 250,000, which is quite a lot, uh, but they are brand new, never been lived in, 90 square meter apartments. As you move further west, you get to a very popular spot for a lot of Scandinavians, particularly Danes, uh, in an area called Fuengarola. Now, Fuengarola is essentially a large city right next to the sea. And there's uh, a, 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 a quite a large population year round. And it's a very much a place where a lot of expats want to come and live and have their holiday homes. A lot of people actually move and reside here. So, that's an interesting area. As you go further to the west, you'll start to come along the A7, which is this coastal road here. A7 is the main artery for the Costa del Sol. And you come along places like La Cala de Mijas, Riviera, Calahonda, Cabapino, and eventually you come into Marbella. Now, Marbella from Malaga Airport is still only about 45, 50 minutes drive. Now, Marbella, 
in case you don't know the history of Marbella, it was a very glitzy, glamorous place where a lot of the European elite would come and have their holiday homes. However, Marbella has had a bad rap in recent years. There was a, a scandal about 10, 15 years ago where a lot of building licenses were given out uh, on the back of bribes. And in fact, the town hall was raided. And so currently there's quite a bit of, um, let's call it bureaucracy in order to get through which building licenses are correct and which building licenses were given out illegally. And what that means is in Marbella, if you have a legitimate building license and you've actually developed a property there, you've probably had to pay quite a lot or gone through a lot of legal battles in order to get that license legalized. So what that means is those licenses or developments with those licenses are at a premium. So you'll find that a lot of the properties in Marbella are very, um, let's say, at the top end of people's price brackets because of this, because there's a short supply of legitimate um, plots and therefore to develop on those plots has cost the developer a lot of money. So therefore they need to recuperate that money by obviously pricing their units a little bit higher. So um, this is why Marbella still remains a very, very popular destination and a place to have a holiday home, but it is also a place that is quite expensive. But if your family have been coming to Marbella for years, if you know the bars and restaurants, and you know the fact that it's got a lovely shopping street, it is still very desirable, but you pay for it. As we say in real, uh, real estate, location, 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 and that is prime location. As we move further west, what you'll see is you come into other very exclusive areas like Nueva Andalusia, which is very much considered the Gulf Valley with a number of golf courses there. Very popular with Scandinavians who like to play at Los Naranjos Golf Club. And, uh, and then you get to the uh, Puerto Banús, which is the, the probably the most glitzy port in perhaps Europe, but definitely in Spain. Um, Puerto Banús is, is famed for having beautiful shops along the marina front. So we're talking Gucci and Prada have their shops there. We're talking about people who have very sophisticated cars, the Bentleys and other convertibles. And, and it actually is a place where a lot of people like to be seen. So I, I personally love to go to Puerto Banús to spend the day there, but I'm not sure whether you can get the best value in Puerto Banús unless you really need to be in there you'll be paying a lot of money, especially for an apartment within the actual marina. So Puerto Banús still remains a very interesting place uh, where people want to invest, but you're not going to get a price point around, the, let's say, 2,000 per square meter, which you can get towards Estepona. You're probably looking at four or 5,000 per square meter around there. So as we move further west from um, Puerto Banús, you come into San Pedro, which used to be quite a Spanish town. A lot of development is happening there and you've got beautiful villas and, and people are obviously looking at San Pedro because of a great accessibility to places like Puerto Banús. So again, we're seeing price hikes in the San Pedro area. Where we are seeing the best value, I would say, is uh, around Estepona and west. So if you look at the map here, we're sort of going towards the very west end of the Costa del Sol before we come to Soto Grande, which is where I live. Estepona has had a really good few years where the mayor of Estepona has actually been nominated for mayor of year in Spain three times, and I believe he's won twice because of his really strong town planning. And what you have in Estepona is a beautiful, charming old town. You also have uh, close proximity to the sea and lots of variety in properties. So you can find properties there which are a walk to the shops and town centre, a walk to the beach. You can also find beautiful villas, setback, thinkers, uh, country homes. And at the same time, if you go slightly west outside of Estepona, there's a lot of lovely new developments with price points starting around 200000 for brand new properties with amenities like spa and wellness and things like this. So it's a really interesting area. Obviously, um, if you want a villa which is new build, you have to find the right plot or you work for a developer who's already got the options of the plot. and They can work uh, and help you build the villa of your dreams. Or you go down the resales avenue, which is looking at what's already on the market, secondhand homes, and making sure that uh, you know it meets your needs and perhaps you may need to do some refurbishment. 
So if we just think, continue on the guide to areas, if we go further to the west, Manilva is an interesting place. It's uh, perhaps a little bit quieter. And uh, a lot of people who live in Manilva like it because of the proximity to a smaller port called the Puerto de la Duquesa. So Duquesa port in English. Lovely, charming port with bars and restaurants. And then if you go right to the west, you come to Soto Grande. And Soto Grande is rather exclusive. It's a place where a lot of the Spanish aristocracy have their homes. It's where a lot of, I would say, uh, CEOs and captains of business have their second home. So we're talking about really beautiful super villas. There's a lovely um, marina. Well, there's plenty of apartments in the marina. Very different to, uh, to Puerto Benusa's marina because that's, uh, very much a commercial marina with shops, bars, and restaurants, whereas Soto Grande, I would say, is more of a residential marina where there are bars, shops, and restaurants, but not to the same extent as Puerto Banús. If I was to compare the difference between Marbella and Soto Grande, they both have people with, with money, but the people in Soto Grande are perhaps a little bit less ostentatious and want to, um, let's say, socialize and play sports more rather than be out... Uh, let's say at the bars, clubs and restaurants. So that is, if you want a quieter life, you may consider west of Marbella. If you want to be in the thick of the action, Marbella is great, Fuengarola is great, Beno Madden is great as well. So that there is a guide to the areas, okay? If you have any questions, by the way, please raise your hand and we can make sure that we answer them, okay? So moving forward, um, one other thing which is interesting to talk about, of course, is whether you're interested in buying a new or a resale. So we sell both. And what's interesting um, is the fact that there, are, there has been a really strong protection against the consumer in the past years. So in the 2008 crisis, uh, where there was a lot of people who lost a lot of money buying new or off plan, the Spanish government has really cracked down on developers. So any developer uh, has to provide a uh, customer with a bank guarantee. And if you work with a lawyer, he will procure that bank guarantee before he allows you to move forward uh, with any deal. And we will talk about lawyers in a minute. And so what that's meant is there's now an appetite again for a lot of new builds, especially with coronavirus. What we're noticing is the appetite is changing from, let's call it more um, traditional Spanish style to more open plan living, things that can be cleaned easier, things which offer more within the communities. We're talking about things like wellness centers or gyms and things like this. So a lot of people are changing what they want out of a home. And at the same time, um, they're looking to ha perhaps have a, a, a more easy life in Spain where they don't have to engage in really strong or heavy refurbishment, which can be difficult and challenging. Uh, but it obviously can be done. A lot of people do this. So why would you buy a resale? Why would you buy new? Essentially, you'd buy a resale for about five good reasons, because you want to get a really good price. In today's market, what we're noticing is that new developments are not dropping in prices considerably. We get sent one or two special units within a development, which are under the typical square meter pricing but we do not have a blanket drop in prices across new developments. However, on the, new, on the resale side of things, everything is down to the actual vendor's personal liquidity. And a lot of people have been hit hard by coronavirus. So even if something is marketed or listed at half a million, if you were to come in with an offer, let's say 10% underneath asking price, I'm quite sure it would be looked at strongly. This is the market we're in. We sold a property recently for 400,000, uh, which was on at 400,000, a resale, and we managed to get the buyer 350,000. So that is a 13% reduction. So deals can be made on resales. And of course, a lot of the resales are in the prime locations. We're talking in the city centers or we're talking short walk to the beach. Um, so if you need a place in an established location, you may have to go down the resale other reasons are people just love Andalusian charm. The white gleaming cube does not work for everybody. And the other major reason is you pay transfer tax rather than EVA. EVA is VAT, which is 10% for a property purchase. Transfer tax is based on a tranche system. Depending on the property price, you'll go into different tranches, but under 400,000, it's 8%. So you save 2% in taxes in your buying cost. 
And of course, the big reason is people want to move in their property now, and that's why they will choose a resale rather than waiting. Conversely, on a new property, if you love modern design, if you want something that's never been lived in, then that's for you. At the same time, new properties offer a really interesting payment plan. Typically, we're talking about 30% down and then 70% on completion when title deeds are handed over. Uh, in this modern age, everybody wants uh, or cares more about energy efficiency. So new properties provide that with proper insulation, very nice double glazed windows and the design in itself. Aerothermic systems, which you might know, uses the heat from the air and recycles it to boil the water to, to reduce your, your water heating costs. And of course, the new properties are competing against each other, so they need to provide more bang for your buck. So we're seeing developments which have got gyms, wellness centers, all these other features, which appeals to the foreign buyer. Um, and the other thing on the investment side of things, because you're basically essentially waiting for your property, you get a, a discount to the completed value. And we normally see about 10 to 15% uptick in value upon completion. So as an investment, it's quite interesting. You're paying for it in time, and therefore you're getting a slight discount to the completed market value. But it's whether you're willing to wait one to two years. So this is the difference between new or resale. Moving forward, so the next on the agenda is, excuse me, buying costs. So we touched upon that uh, just a minute ago. Buying costs for a resale, you pay transfer tax, and you can see the tranches there. 8% if it's under 400,000, 9% under 700. Where you buy a new property, you pay EVA or VAT. Okay, so already there could be potentially a 2% saving. In all cases, you have to pay for a notary. Now I've inflated, sometimes you can get notary fees at half a percent. So I just want to give you the worst case scenario, okay? Then you, it's strongly advisable to use a lawyer. For their services, it's 1% on the property price plus EVA. The EVA on services is 21%, which is why we put 1.21%. And then stamp duty. So all in all, you're looking at about, I would say, 10.5% to 13.5% in buying costs. If you did want to use a mortgage broker, and we're going to touch upon that, maybe Tancred can explain a little bit, it's 1% on the loan amount, but they obviously provide you value in playing the banks against each other and getting you the best interest rates. So moving forward, top properties. Now, these are our most, let's say, clicked on and are our biggest sellers. This top left-hand corner is golf apartments in Casares, which is slightly inland from the coast. We're talking literally five minutes inland from the coast. And these are two bed apartments which have um, lifetime membership to golf courses. A lot of our customers are golfers. And this is a nine hole golf course attached with a gym and spa and all of this. So it's proven very prop popular. I think we've sold about eight to 10 properties there. The people buying are Dutch, uh, Brits, Hong Kong Chinese, uh, we've sold to Americans from San Francisco. So uh, these sorts of golf properties definitely attract the international clientele. What's interesting as well about this property is it's very close to a very exclusive hotel called Finca Cortesin. And Finca Cortesin has won, I think it's Condé Nast best hotel in Europe for the past two years. They've also won Golf Digest best golf re resort for a couple of years running. So if you buy here, you are in essentially this area for appreciation. And that's why a lot of investors choose this area. Not only do you get a great property, but you also get something which will appreciate well because of what's happening in the area. Here to the right-hand side, this is another golf property. It's a semi-detached villa, which we've sold near um, Atalaya, which is a golf course near Marbella. What's great is we are very early in the cycle. So this property is on a 370, or the customer bought it at 370. There's a, many units available. I think there's still 40% to be sold. And already they've put the prices up. So typically the way in which it works is when a developer hits a 50% sales mark, they can go out and get funding from banks. When they get funding from banks, they've essentially managed their cash flow from that point. So they can start increasing the prices on the units and then start really pushing for higher profitability. So if you wanted to get something off plan or early in the cycle, that's when you really get the best value, just before they get 50% sold. So this same property at 370 now has been raised to 390. 
and it's only been three or four months, but they've just broken that 50% sold barrier. Bottom left, this is called Pure South. This is in Manila. Again, beautiful modern design. And what's great about these is you can get a three bedroom apartment here for 235,000 euros with sea views. Very nice indeed. And here, this is another seller for us. This is in Estepona, above the city of Estepona, walking down. It's very much like a holiday resort, huge lagoon pools. It's got a 2,000 meter squared wellness area with gym and CrossFit and things like this. A paddle center, maybe some of you don't know what paddle tennis is, but essentially paddle tennis is um, it's a, short, a smaller game of tennis, very popular in Spain. So they have six paddle courts, a tennis court, underneath a huge gym, they have it all. So this is proving to be very popular for people that want the, the amenities. Okay, I'm just gonna take a quick breath, see if anybody else is trying to get in. Uh, one second. Okay, we shall carry on. So, moving forward, resales. Now, we just talked about resales, how you can save in transfer tax. This is just a pick of what's available in the market, and I hope you can see that we're trying to show you variety. We are members of a multi-listing system. I'm sure it's the same in the US as it is in the UK, where all of the agent's properties are aggregated together in a back-end platform. And we can go in and do very sort of uh, specific searches in that platform. So if you wanted a sea view on a plot of 4,000 meters squared with three bedrooms, Wi-Fi, and a pool, uh, we can specify all these finer details to find exactly what you're looking for. These four properties I've shown you because this is a Finca in San Martin, very close to Soto Grande. And um, it's interesting because the owner has found the property with me that he really wants to move on. So he will do something called a pass through savings. Whatever he gets off from a property he wants to move on to, he will apply to his own property so that it's even cheaper than 385,000. And this has got 5,700 meters squared of land, all legal. That's the other thing with thinkers and country homes. Is the building, are the outbuildings all legal? Because this is Spain and sometimes they build stuff without registering it with the town hall, okay? So this is important. This is a golf apartment in San Roque Club, 225,000 for about 180 meters squared with also an 80 meters squared terrace, it's massive. This is below bank repossession prices. The reason I have this one is because uh, the vendor has basically put a crazy offer on a villa, crazy low, and it was accepted. So she can price her apartment very low as well, just to get it sold. So these are the deals we come across regularly. This one here, bottom left-hand corner, is in Torre Guadiaro. You can literally walk down to what they call the gastronomic route of San Roque with all the bars and restaurants. Impeccable sea views. 650,000 on a 1300 meter square plot with a pool and the granny flat. Unbelievable. This one is in Soto Grande and I would say it, and this is out without exaggerating, is quite frankly the best penthouse in uh, Soto Grande. You don't have to go winding streets all through the port to get to it. Easy in, easy out. It's a corner penthouse. It's beautiful. It's got three large bedrooms, multiple terraces, and it really is. Uh, something for someone who wants pure luxury. And the interesting thing is if somebody wants to buy it, the owner, and doesn't want to move into it straight away, the owner will rent it back at 50,000 a year. So uh, he loves it. He's just looking to perhaps cash out and downsize a little bit, okay? So moving forward, mortgages, property management, and lawyers. So we work with a very well-respected lawyer called Santiago de la Cruz. And I would never consider buying a property here without having a lawyer. The Spanish can do it because perhaps in Madrid, because they obviously have the language capabilities. They may have friends who are lawyers or legal paralegals and can look through contracts. But if you're buying in a foreign country, you want to make sure that everything is totally legit. And for 1%, it saves you a lot of drama. He will do property searches. He'll check for licenses. He'll check if a bank guarantees in place. 
Um, he will help you with your utilities and setting them all up, like your electricity and water. If you wanted to rent the property out, he'll even procure you a, um, a rental license because you need to have that for short-term lettings. So within his package of services, you get a, you get a lot of things. He'll also uh, get you your foreign identity number called an NIE number, which you need in order to buy here. Saves you from queuing up at the police station. Sometimes you have to go back three or four times just to get in through the door. Uh, his assistant takes care of it all. And at the same time, um, you have a trusted advisor. Um, the way in which it works is he doesn't charge until we go to something called private purchase contract which is essentially the first step. I guess it's the same as exchanging in the UK, but it's essentially the first step where you agree the contract and then you agree the completion date, which might be two months later. So he charges half at that point and half at the end. Um, and it's very well worth having. On the property management side, we have a couple of property management partners. This is very much geared for people who want to buy and then rent out. They will look after your properties. They'll make sure that when you have guests coming, there's someone to meet them to do the key exchange. They'll market your properties on the short-term rental portals and they'll look after your properties, check the inventory each time a guest comes in and leaves. And of course, organize all the cleaning and the laundry being done. Normally they'll use platforms like booking.com or Airbnb and they obviously charge for this service. So we're looking at about 15 to 20% on whatever you gain in rental income is the cost which you have to pay them. But for a typical two bedroom apartment, let's say a nice one, which is new, you're looking at about, let's say a thousand a week in high season. And you could probably rent it out quite comfortably for about eight weeks in high season. Obviously, if you wanted to rent it more in the mid season and low season, you'd do something on your pricing but we always shoot for about 25 to 30 uh, weeks of a year rented out. So if you can rent on an average of let's say 800 per week, rent it out just to keep the mass very simple, 30 weeks per year, you can generate about 24,000 and then take away your community costs, your property management costs, other costs involved like uh, what else is there? If you have a mortgage, you can end up having a property that does not cost you anything to live in and can actually pay for your flights and your trips down here to use it. So long as you use it in the majority of the time in the winter months when it's low season. And of course, because this is a Costa del Golf, we have a lot of golf trips coming here and it, it just makes sense for four guys to rent an apartment rather than to rent two uh, standard rooms in a hotel. It's just much cheaper. The golf season is pretty much from March to November these days. So, so that's how that works. Maybe what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just try and unmute you, Tancred, and you could talk a little bit about um, mortgages. I guess you are the person that says uh, usuario, so I'll ask to unmute. All right, you got that? I can hear you. Can the rest of you hear <laughs> okay. your thumbs up if you can hear Tancred? <laughs> okay, very good. Um, okay, so the first thing that we do when we uh, speak to a client for the first time um, is assess the uh, self-funding requirement. Um, that's essential because really there's no way around that. The self-funding requirement of the funds that they need is what they need. Um, and the first thing I suppose that the client uh, would need to be aware of is, is the fact that um, a maximum loan to value for a non-resident in Spain with a Spanish bank is, would be 70% of the uh, net purchase price. Okay, so um, taking into account the fact for on a resale, we're looking at around 13 to four, uh, 12 to 13 percent costs, and uh, on a brand new property, 15 to 16 percent. That would mean that the client would need approximately 43 percent for a resale and about 45 to 46 for a brand new property. So that is the that is essential because uh, the banks will always uh, want to see that and see evidence of, of those funds being available. Um, at the point at uh, which we uh, submit the application. Uh, the second thing is, of course, uh, the affordability. We, we do the affordability calculations when we first speak to the client. And uh, typically, I mean, all the banks work on slightly different percentages and so on. 
but typically everything is done on monthly here so uh, typically uh, they'll add up uh, all of the um, monthly commitments that the client has in the form of existing loans mortgages um, uh, rents they might pay and so on in their own country add it to the new one and typically all of that cannot represent more than 35 percent of net monthly income uh, there's of course there's, ex uh, there's exceptions and, and there's um, situations where some banks will, will work on a slightly higher percentage and so on um, but that is is sort of fairly standard um, so really the uh, going back to what you said earlier about the playing banks against each other yes yeah, certainly we've been doing this for 17 years here so um, you know our relationships with our banks are, are, are very long-standing um, and uh, you know we will literally sit in front of the manager and and um, put put forward a, a submit an application and really squeeze the very best conditions that can be got for them so while we charge one percent of the loan amount broker fee by the way we charge nothing up front this is only payable on completion in other words if the client takes accepts our mortgage offer um, we expect that the client would get that money back within a year or so in the form of, of, of lower lower costs and um, better um, interest rates. Very good. Now, Tancred, did we not manage to achieve 1.8% recently? Uh, is that the levels that we can get? Yeah, typically the, the first year is often um, uh, slightly higher because they fix it for, for one year, first year, and because now the bank assumes uh, a large amount of the costs before um, the client used to have to pay the AJD stamp duty on the loan, they had to pay for the land registry, the history of the notary charges. Um, now the bank has to assume all of those costs. And one of the ways that they try to get a little bit back, I suppose, is by charging a slightly higher rate in the first year. So you might pay 2.2, 2.5, something like this in the first year, but then it will uh, revert in year two to margin uh, plus 12 month durable, which is the uh, the base rate that they use here. Okay, so um, bearing in mind that 12, uh, 12 month uh, Euribor is minus at the moment, it's negative. Um, typically, if the margins are around 1.9, then then the the client will will be paying something like 1.8 uh, in the second year. Very good. So actually, it's an interesting time to get a mortgage because the rates are so low. And can you fix long for like 10? 10 years or yeah, yeah yeah you can fix you can fix uh 10 15 20 25 years and of course the longer the, the fix the, the the higher the rate because of course yeah. the, the, the bank is assuming a bit more risk uh, as time goes on so um you know you'll be looking at some somewhere around 2.5 2.75 on a 20-year fix and going up to maybe late twos or early threes for a 25-year fix so um, you know, that can definitely be worthwhile, but you've got to remember that in any fix, uh, you have somebody on the other side taking a, an opposite risk. And so uh, um, <laughs> we're actually recommending that people take variable mortgages at the moment because the rates don't look like they're going to go up for, for some time. Very good. Last question before I let you go. And, um, tell me, if you're a more senior person, let's say 60 years old or so, you still have some products which can help them, right? Yeah, we got, um, I mean, most, most lenders will go to 75 years old in any case. So if they're 60, then we can do a 15 year term. However, I do have one product in particular, which we've used many, many times, um, that goes to 80 years old, although they do reduce the LTV or loan to value to 60% in that case. But really quite often, people are, who are 60 years old do have a, a, a fair amount of deposit availability. So um, often we find that works very, very well. So in that case, they would get a 20 year term with a 60% mortgage and it's, it's a great product. Good. Well, what we're noticing is a lot of buyers who have cash actually want to take advantage of a low interest rate. So keep their cash and, and still get a mortgage. So. Yes, exactly. And 60% and is probably an optimum, optimum level for them, you know, in that case at that age. You know, you don't want to be dying with a mortgage particularly, do you? Even if it is called mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> <That loan. laughs> okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Tancred, for joining us. All right. uh, very, very, cool. very welcome. Yeah, Good welcome. to speak to you. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Let me just carry on. So we've talked about lawyers, we've talked about mortgages with Tancred. By the way, I'm going to send this out uh, so you can get his contact details and property management. And the next thing is to talk about something quite interesting called the Golden Visa. Now, the Golden Visa is an attempt of the Spanish government, similar to Portugal, to bring foreign investment into the country. 
and it's based upon uh, investment into property. Uh, now that can be commercial property, residential, um, so you could buy a home and a restaurant as long as it totals 500,000 euros. And what that does is it gives you residency in Spain and free movement through the Schengen zone. So it's quite popular with Chinese, quite popular with um, Arabic people. So it's an interesting product. Now, I believe that they may even reduce it down to 400,000 to compete with Portugal. But right now it's half a million and our lawyer can help uh, anybody who wants to apply for this. The other thing to say is um, you can later apply for Spanish nationality, which might be useful if you really want to leave the US, for instance. We're seeing a lot of Americans actually look at uh, these golden visas as well as something called the non-lucrative visa. The non-lucrative visa is a different type of visa where you must never be able to work in Spain and prove a monthly income. I believe it's about 2,500 euros a month. Okay, so uh, that's how it works. I'm not sure how they tackle remote working because that's a little bit of a loophole. If you're residing in Spain but working remotely and, and earning a living, maybe there's obviously some tax implications to that, which is why it's good to have a contact like we do at a good law firm who can guide you through the whole process. So that's the golden visas for you. Moving forward. Next one is moving with kids. This is my personal experience. Um, I used to live in Spain 10 years ago and uh, back then I only had two kids and now I have four kids. So we decided to come back to Spain after living, I've lived in um, Denmark, London, the US, Singapore, uh, where else have I lived? Different parts of the US, so down in Florida, also up in Connecticut. And to be honest, this is paradise. This is where I want to raise my kids. And my wife made me promise, pretty much on our wedding day when it was in Spain, bring me back to Spain, even though she's Danish from Copenhagen area. So we've come back two years ago and uh, brought our four kids with us. And a lot of people are scared about the impact it will have to their kids. And I will tell you, hand on heart, it's been the best decision ever. Our kids only go to local school. We can't afford international school. There are plenty of great international schools along the coast. We're talking Sota Grande International School all the way to a lower college or San Jose. Uh, there's a great German school in La Mirena. But international schools are available. However, if you wanted to put your kids into local school, just to really give them that baptism of fire, I can speak from experience that my kids are one year in and they're, they're really loving it. It's been hard, but they're now speaking fluently, doing all their classes in Spanish and the local schools really supported them. They had two sessions every week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which is Spanish for foreigners. My kids were put down a grade because they thought it would be easier if they were to go through work they've already done in Denmark but in Spanish to help them not you know, get behind and feel stressed about their, their inability to learn so quickly. So they're essentially repeating a year. Um, as far as employment here, look, the main industries are obviously tourism and hospitality. We don't know how that's going to be impacted at this point, but the signs are with the de-escalation that there will be a good summer. You know, people, especially the Brits, they can't keep themselves away from Spain. They just love it here. Um, and of course, the Scandinavians and the Germans, they still love coming to Spain. The hotel operators right now have to be at 50% capacity just because of, uh, let's call it social distancing. Um, but eventually this will dissipate. I think the de-escalation in Spain has actually been handled very well. Very strict indeed at the start, which kept everybody indoors. We weren't even allowed out. And then the de-escalation has been happening as per the different schedules for the phased out approach. So I've been quite impressed. And given that, I do believe that the tourism industry and hospitality will bounce back. Malaga is quite an interesting area if you're into more sort of technical uh, work. So there's, I think, some big centers. I believe Oracle have got a center there. Of course, Malaga International Airport, if you're in aviation or anything like that as a consideration. Gibraltar International Airport. Um, so there are different sectors here, and I would always get onto a recruitment site. So something like uh, Reed, for instance, uh, is a big one, and put your location in Spain, or there's another thing. Uh, I think there's sites like Move to Spain. Um, there's lots of different recruitment sites, so you can always browse them, and of course there's LinkedIn. 
Um, so this place has offered us a life less ordinary, it's a fact. We, we go to the beach at the end of the day, we're out hiking in the countryside, we're having cheap dinners, we're spending, you know, we're a family of six, sometimes as little as 10 euros a head uh, at some of these Spanish venters, these country pubs in, in land. And the other thing is to say is we, you know, I'm in real estate, I'm a humble guy and I, I don't think I make a vast salary. So we're living quite comfortably, a family of six, on 3,000 euros a month. That's a big question I get asked all the time. About a third of that is our housing, a third of that is other fixed costs, car payments and things like this, electric bills, utilities, and then we have a third to spend. Now on paper to anyone from Northern Europe or America, 1,000 euros a month is not a lot of money, but things are still cheap here. Our weekly shop is about 150 euros a week, um, and then, a couple of hundred euros a, a month to go out for dinner and to do some activities with the kids. It's a simple life, but a great life. So if that's the sort of thing which is interesting for you, this place offers so much value beyond, you know, just properties and lifestyle. You can do a lot. So it's a very, very good decision. I'm very eager to talk to anyone who wants some first-hand knowledge and experience of how it goes. And we can guide you, link you up to different accountants if you need to get your taxes prepared. We've done it all. So we can offer that service. Lastly, so how do we work? Um, I'm going to wrap up quite quickly because it's been a long call, but we work very simply on um, viewing tours. We love to get customers down here. We do a selection of properties handpicked and we essentially work two or three days driving to these properties and showing the customers firsthand sitting down, having coffees and lunches at places nearby so you get to know the area as well, even golf if you're a golfer. And then typically we find a, cu a customer a property they're really interested in and we can move to the next stage, which is meeting a lawyer, meeting someone like Tancred if a mortgage is required, even meeting the property management if it's a, a rent to buy property. Um, and of course, we will help with the, the hotel booking, telling you where's a good hotel. We'll pick you up from the airport, uh, we'll drop you off as well. And essentially, it's a really fun few days together. We, we love people that centralize their search with us. We're very efficient. We do all the appointments set up. If you try and do it yourselves, it's very difficult just to get hold of a lot of the Spanish agents. I, I mean, this is not to put them down, but I've come here with a Northern European work ethic and we get things done. And we have, you know, we work through a day eight properties a day, four in the morning, four in the afternoon. You can never make a decision unless you see a lot. Even though something might not be exactly what you want, unless you see it uh, with our guidance as to why it could be an interesting property, you'll never know. And we want people to feel comfortable to make a decision. So that's what the viewing tours are all about. And if you buy with us, we refund the cost of your travel, so your flight for two. Um, if you're coming from further afield like China, the US or Middle East, we'll have to figure out a, a fair and equitable way because we are running a small business, but we want to give you an incentive. So that is how, how we work. That is a guide to the Costa del Sol. That is a guide to the buying process. I've recorded this, so um, I really would love you guys to reach out. We could do another private Zoom call and uh, let's keep the dialogue going and we're here to serve you. Our motto is very simple, good people selling to good people. So I hope that worked out for you. Anybody got any questions or anything? Because I've got a few minutes before my viewing. I'll unmute everybody. One second. Stuart. If anyone's got any questions, I think I've unmuted you all. Hey, Stuart, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Hello, Ludek. All right. Very good presentation. Thank you for inviting me for a call. Just quick questions, because obviously, as we discussed earlier, if we would target some customers from Central Eastern Europe, um, do, you have, do you know if you compare a Portug Portuguese or French market when it comes to terms? Is it like a similar or is there any advantages? buying in Spain particularly than in 
Portugal or, or in France. You know what I mean? If 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 the con conditions that Tancred has mentioned, all the fees. I'm not an expert on Portugal and, and France, but I will tell you two very close customers have bought in Spain because of the bureaucracy in France and the windiness of Portugal. So it's two very different reasons. One is very difficult to get deals done in, in, in France. And the other thing is the climate in Portugal was not as similar to the Costa del Sol. Um, okay. So that was, those are two reasons why people choose Spain rather than those other two countries. Just to give some argument, you know, when you speak with some clients from, from, from let's say from my country, you know. Understood. Any other questions? I've literally got about five minutes before I have to show a place, a property to someone. So if you have any questions, maybe you can shoot them by email or something like that, or, or we can go from there. Javier, I hope that was good for you. Stefan, thank you very much for joining. And I'm going to share the recording, okay? Thank you, Stuart. Thank, thank you, you all. Stuart. Fantastic. That was great. great. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Sue. See you. <laughs>